In this video, we're going to do some review and make some new connections between matrices, subspaces, and linear systems. There's a lot of vocabulary in this class, and there's a lot of vocabulary in this chapter, so let's review some of it. Let's start with a spanning set. A spanning set refers to a subspace. And a spanning set for a subspace is a set of vectors that spans the set. OK, what does that mean? That means every vector in the subspace can be generated from a linear combination of vectors in the spanning set. We say a set is linearly dependent if at least one of the vectors is a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. In a sense, it provides no direction, new direction information because it is already one of the directions which could be generated from the other vectors in the set. On the other hand, if all the vectors are providing new independent direction information that cannot be generated from the other vectors in the set, we call that set linearly independent. A special set is a basis for a subspace. A basis for a subspace needs to be linearly independent, and it has to span the subspace. And then the dimension of a subspace is the number of vectors in any basis. So every basis has the same number of vectors. That number is what we call the dimension of that subspace. Well, what is a subspace? Well, it's a set of vectors with the following two properties. One, you cannot add your way out of it. If you have two vectors in the subspace, then their sum has to belong to the subspace. We say it's closed under vector addition. And you can't scale your way out of it. If you have a vector in the subspace and you multiply it times any real number, that scaled vector stays in the subspace. We say the subspace is closed under scalar multiplication. So some spaces associated with matrices, we have the row space. That's the space spanned by the rows of A. The column space is the space spanned by the columns of A. And finally, the null space is the solution set of the homogeneous equation AX equals 0. It's the set of all vectors which gets sent to 0 by the matrix A. So some vocabulary associated with rank and nullity. Uh, the column rank of a matrix is the dimension of the column space. So rank and nullity are numbers. The row rank is the dimension of the row space. The rank of the matrix is equal to the column rank, which is the same as the row rank. So the row rank and the column rank are the same for every matrix, and that number is also called the rank. A matrix has full row rank if the row rank is the same as the number of the rows. And we say it has full column rank if the rank is the same as the number of columns. Uh, a matrix has full rank if it has either full row rank or full column rank or both. And uh, the nullity of a matrix is the dimension of the null space. So again, both rank and nullity are numbers, and they refer to a matrix. All right, some vocabulary associated with linear systems. Uh, we know a system is consistent if it has at least one solution. It may have one solution, or it may have infinitely many solutions. Uh, if it has no solutions, we call it inconsistent. Here's a new word that maybe we have not formally defined. A linear system is dependent if the reduced row echelon form of the augmented matrix has at least one row of zeros. And we'll talk more about that towards the end of the video. And then a homogeneous system uh, 
is a system where the right hand side is all zeros. Uh, rank and nullity are numbers, and their sum always adds up to the number of columns in A. And uh, if we're talking about the transpose, we know that the columns of A transpose are the rows of A, so the row space of A is the column space of A transpose. And using similar reasoning, we can say that the column space of A is the row space of A transpose. And uh, since the dimension of all of those are the same, we can say that the rank of A is the same as the rank of A transpose. So I don't think we can emphasize this idea enough, that the matrix equation AX equals B is consistent if and only if B belongs to the column space of A. That is, B can be written as a linear combination of the columns of A. And that's why we emphasize this column-centric view of matrix vector multiplication. A times X is a linear combination of the columns of A. The coefficients are the components of X. So if B can be written as a linear combination of the columns of A, the system is consistent, and the solution vector consists of the coefficients from that linear combination. So as a direct result, the system is consistent if and only if the rank of the augmented matrix is the same as the rank of the coefficient matrix, because if it's consistent, B is a linear combination of the columns of A, so it's adding no new direction information to this augmented matrix that's not already in the columns of A. Now, if I do have a consistent system, I may have infinite man infinitely many solutions, or maybe only one solution, but Let's pick one solution. We'll call it x sub p. And then any other solution can be written as the sum of that first solution, x sub p, and a vector x sub n. A vec sub n a, the vector x sub n is in the null space of A. It's a solution to the homogeneous system. And this should make sense because we can just do some uh, little algebra here. I want to say that if I take AX sub P, if that equals the vector B, then AX sub N equals the zero vector. So then if I add these together, I get AX sub P plus AX sub N equals B. And I can factor out the A. So X sub P plus X sub N would be yet another solution to that system of equations. And finally, any homogeneous system uh, is consistent uh, because you can always choose the solution to be the trivial solution where all of the components of the solution vector are zero. We've seen this table before. In this table, I want to emphasize it deals with full rank coefficient matrices. So we're just looking at our three different cases. If systems, they're underdetermined, square, and overdetermined. Underdetermined, we think of that as being a wide but short rectangular shape. 
meaning that it has more variables than it does equations. If the coefficient matrix is full rank, then that system is consistent for all b, and moreover, you have infinitely many solutions. On the other hand, if you have a full rank square system, same number of equations as you have uh, variables, that will also be consistent for all right-hand sides, but you get exactly one solution. Now, if you have an overdetermined system, so we think of overdetermined, overdetermined means you have more equations than variables. Its shape is going to be thin but tall. Um, it's consistent only when B belongs to the column space of A. In other words, only when B can be written as a linear combination of the columns of A. Uh, but if you have a full rank coefficient matrix, and it's a consistent system, then you get exactly one solution. Let's look at some of these statements in, in more detail and add some more information. So the row rank of a matrix is the number of leading ones in the re reduced row echelon form of A. Uh, the rows in that reduced row echelon form, which have leading ones, form a basis for the row space. You have full row rank if and only if the rows form a linearly independent set. If they don't form a linearly independent set, you're going to get a row of zeros So in the reduced row echelon form. If the system is underdetermined, underdetermined means you have more variables than equations, and your coefficient matrix is full row rank, then we can say two things. The system is consistent for all right-hand sides, and there are infinitely many solutions. On the other hand, if you have a square system, and A has full row rank, then the system is consistent for all right-hand sides, but there's only one, exactly one unique solution. And if the system is overdetermined. If you have more equations than variables, then a, the coefficient matrix cannot have full row rank. And why is that? Because you're going to have a set of vectors which has more vectors in it than the components in the vectors. So for example, you would have six vectors which belong to R4. And we know that six vectors, which belong to R4, cannot be linearly independent. All right, similar statements for column rank. Uh, the column rank is the number of leading columns in the uh, reduced row echelon form of A. Uh, the columns of A, so we have to be careful with the column space. We can't use columns from the reduced row echelon form. We have to go back to the original matrix. But the, or mat the columns from the original matrix A corresponding to the leading columns of the reduced row echelon form, they make a basis for the column space of A. Uh, you have full column rank um, if and only if the columns form a linearly independent set. Um, and equivalently, you have full column rank if the reduced row echelon form has no free columns. Now, if you have an overdetermined system, so you have more equations than variables, uh, the system is consistent only when B is in the column space of A. And that's always true. Um, that's actually a true statement for every system that uh, it's, it's a way you could define uh, consistent. B must be a linear combination of the columns of A. Uh, so if you have an M by N matrix, remember M is the number of rows, N is the number of columns. So if the dimension of the column space is N, the dimension of the column space is the number of columns, then that's full column rank. 
if we have a square system and we have full column rank, then the system has to be consistent for all right-hand side. And uh, as we said before, uh, the solution is unique. There is only one solution. Uh, if the uh, system is underdetermined, it has more variables than equations. That means the matrix A has more columns than it does row then A cannot have full column rank. And again, it's a situation where if I have more columns than rows, then the column vectors, I have more column vectors than there are components in each vector. So it's, again, it's back to having you know, seven vectors in R3. Well, they can't form a linearly independent set. Now here's an important idea. Uh, if A has full column rank, its columns form a basis for the column space of A. And if the columns of A are linearly dependent, so we don't have full column rank, what do we know? Well, we can find a linearly independent set of columns by selecting the columns corresponding to the leading columns. The columns from A corresponding to the leading columns in the reduced row echelon form. And moreover, we can express the free columns, or the columns corresponding to the free columns, as a linear combination of the vectors in the linearly independent set. And we don't have to do much work to do that because the coefficients already appear in the reduced row echelon form. If we want to look for the vector corresponding to free column J, we look at the column entries corresponding to the uh, leading variables uh, in the Jth column of the reduced row echelon form. What about the null space? Well, the null space has a number associated uh, with it. It's the nullity. That's the rank of the null space. And that's the same as the number of free columns in the reduced row echelon form of A. If you have a matrix with full column rank, then you're not going to have any free columns. And so uh, the null space is just going to consist of the zero vector, and the nullity will be zero. If we want to find a basis for the null space, we can sight read it from the reduced row echelon form of A. I have to focus a little bit on this. First of all, you're going to get one basis vector for every free column. That makes sense, because the nullity is the number of free columns. Uh, and for each basis vector, so the, for the basis vector corresponding to the jth free column, it's going to have the same number of components as there are columns of A. That makes the AX equals 0 multiplication possible. It's going to have a 1 in the jth component. So corresponding to the jth free column, a 1 in the jth component. Uh, the components corresponding to the leading variables are the opposite, opposite in sign of the corresponding entries in column J, and then everything else is a zero. We talked about dependent systems. We said the definition is the augmented matrix has at least one row of zeros. Another way of thinking of that is that the a system is dependent of at least one of the equations can be written as a linear combination of the other equations. An equation which can be written as a linear combination of other equations is called redundant. We really don't need it in that system. If we throw that redundant system re equation out, we do not change the solution set of the system. So let's look at an example. Here is a uh, system with four equations and four unknowns, four variables. Uh, and I'm telling you that this system is dependent. I'd like for you to show that it's dependent. And then the other thing is we'd like to write the redundant equations 
as a linear combination of the independent equation. Well, we need the augmented matrix and its reduced row echelon form. So I went ahead and calculated that for you. And looking at the reduced row echelon form, of course, we see two rows of zeros. So there must be two redundant equations. There's two leading ones, so there must be two independent equations. And so what this tells me is that uh, we have two independent equations, two redundant equations. If we take the first two equations as independent, they correspond to the leading ones, um, then that's great. Uh, we're done, right? There are no um, uh, there are no uh, other equations that are necessary. We're going to get the same uh, solution set. Now, I actually have to be a little bit careful here with the statement that I just made. Um, yes, in this case, it's clear that if I take the first two equations, that they are going to be linearly independent because if I look at the corresponding rows in the augmented matrix, they're not multiples of each other. So that's fine. There could be other instances when maybe the first two equations are multiples of each other, in which case I can't take the first two, even though I have leading ones in the first two rows. So what can I do? Well, if we answer this question, how can we write the remaining equations as a linear combination of the first two, uh, then I think we'll answer our other equation too. Because we don't know how to do this with rows, but we do know how to do it for columns. Remember that if you have the reduced row echelon form of A and the you have a matrix A where the columns are linearly dependent, and we want to find a linearly independent set and write the remaining columns as a linear combination of those linearly independent vectors, then we refer to the reduced row echelon form. The leading columns give us our linearly independent set, and then the coefficients from the free columns help us write the remaining columns as linear combinations of the linearly independent vectors. So we're working with rows when we're talking about dependent systems. Well, we know that there is an associated matrix whose columns are the rows of B, and that is the transpose. So here is a, one of the reasons, there's many, many reasons, why we use the transpose of a matrix. We have an operation which only works for columns. We want it to work for rows. Fine. Let's apply it to the transpose of a matrix. Since the rows of B are the columns of B transpose, we can find a dependence equation for each free column of B transpose and convert that to a dependence equation for the corresponding row of B. Now, I didn't put that in here, but moreover, we get a set of linearly independent columns of B transpose, and that will give us our
independent equations. So the corresponding equations or the corresponding rows from the matrix B, the ones that correspond to the linearly independent columns of B transpose, that's going to form then a independent linear system. All right, so unfortunately, there is no shortcut to get the reduced row echelon form of B transpose from the reduced row echelon form of the matrix B. So I went ahead and did the work again for you. And from this, we can see that, uh, again, the first two columns of B transpose, that would correspond to the first two equations in our system. Those would be a linearly, well, they'd be linearly independent rows of B, and those would be independent equations in our system. But what about uh, equation three and equation four? Well, we can write a dependence equation for the third column. The third column is the first uh, column minus three times the second column. The fourth column is three times the first column plus six times the second column which means that if we go back to the matrix B, we can make a similar statement for the rows of B, that the third row of B is the first row minus three times the second row. The fourth row is three times the first row plus six times the second row, which means that for our linear system, the third equation is the first equation minus three times the second equation. And the fourth equation is three times the first equation plus six times the second equation. Now, this process works with any dependent system of equations. And it provides us with the minimizing theorem. Given a dependent system of equations with our augmented matrix B, we're going to compute the reduced row echelon form of B transpose. The equations corresponding to the leading columns of R form an independent system. So I should be looking at the reduced row echelon form of B transpose to find my independent system. And the coefficients from the free columns of R can be used to write the redundant equations as linear combinations of the independent equations. So I hope this review was useful, and I hope that this minimizing theorem has provided you with new insight into redundant or independent systems of equations.